We're standing in the lobby, and then all of a sudden, boom. Wild weather from around the world. We may not make it out of this alive. People in life-threatening situations. Oh my God, we've got damage. Climate change is having a dramatic and dangerous effect. I had the thoughts going through my head at the time that I may get, be getting sucked out of this. World's wildest weather. First-hand accounts from people caught in the middle of catastrophic climatic events, with real footage filmed at the time. Red, go! Red! Expert analysis will also unpick how nature creates these incredible weather phenomena and explain the science behind them. One of the most extreme weather conditions to wreak havoc around the world is a hurricane, or cyclone as it's sometimes called. Violent, swirling storms up to 1,000 miles wide which form across the ocean. And it's in the tropics that some of the worst hurricanes have occurred. In September 2014, the resort town of Cabo San Lucas, off the coast of the Baja California Peninsula in Mexico, experienced the most catastrophic hurricane in its history. And for holidaymakers and locals, it came with little warning. A hurricane is defined by having sustained wind speeds of 74 miles per hour or greater. So 74 mile per hour wind speed alone is going to be dangerous because they'll be flying debris. We know it's enough to do damage to less well-built structures. But it's more than wind. Hurricanes typically bring very heavy rainfall with them and also surge if you're along the coastlines. That's water from the ocean itself moving inland with the forward momentum of this hurricane as it's making landfall. So it's really a threefold threat, wind, rain, and storm surge. Josh Morgerman is a storm chaser who travels the world putting himself in life-threatening situations so he can record these extreme weather conditions. He drove to Cabo San Lucas to be in the eye of the storm. I go to Cabo San Lucas a lot. It's a popular resort city. It's close to Southern California. And the thing about Cabo is that it gets uh, threatened by hurricanes a lot. They come close. Sometimes they hit the city, but they're never that bad. So as Hurricane Odile approached, People didn't seem too worried. No one was covering their windows. No one was rushing out to get food and water. People were just kind of like, whatever about it. And they had no idea what was coming. Now, Hurricane Odile ended up being one of the most powerful hurricanes to make landfall across the Bay California region. But it started its life thousands of miles east of that. Now, hurricanes tend to form or spawn across the warm waters of the North Atlantic sometimes coming out from an easterly wave from the west coast of Africa, and this is what happened with deal. The ocean is always a needed component for you to get a hurricane or a tropical system because it's the fuel for that system. Otherwise, you just have a regular complex of thunderstorms that you can get over land or over ocean, but the ocean is what's providing that tremendous amount of energy and moisture to turn it into a cyclone. It whips up the waves as well, so a significant storm surge and a huge amount of rain. The sheer volume of water meant when it made landfall, everyone was at risk. We're driving around Cabo San Lucas, wind rapidly picking up. It's just uh, it's about 725, and uh, we feel like the core of the hurricane is closing in. So as the hurricane was approaching Cabo San Lucas, we had an idea that the center was going to cross the coast very close to our hotel. Uh, meaning kind of the east side of the city, and we wanted to get right where that center was, so we decided, hey, let's just ride it out in our hotel. And we ended up being right, we hit the bullseye. The exact center of the hurricane passed right over us. Wind's blowing like crazy, it's starting to really whistle. The trees are bending, it's 45 degrees. I think, uh, I think stuff's gonna start to break. So after trundling along for several days, Odile started to intensify, becoming a Cat 2 with wind strengths up to 125 miles an hour and then eventually becoming a Cat 4 with wind strengths up to 140 miles an hour. 
This is a huge, destructive beast. It was raining really hard, and the howling started to get more like a like a rumbling, and you started to feel in the gusts that, okay, this is getting serious, this is not a normal storm. The building started to rattle a little bit. And as we went into late evening, it got worse and worse. The wind was just pounding at the front doors of the lobby, and we did everything we could to keep the wind out. We kept piling more and more furniture against those doors, but it didn't matter. The wind just kept blowing everything aside. 9.20 p.m., and the hurricane was ramping up and there was no holding that wind back. It kept just like pushing everything out and coming back in. And finally, we just gave up. And uh, it was basically like the hurricane decided that it was gonna own that lobby. It's just after 10 o'clock. We're probably getting the strongest winds we've had all night. We're hearing roaring, screaming sounds, sounds of an airplane going by. That's a sign of very high winds. Oh, we just lost a big window. And when you can't even keep the front doors closed and they just blow off and the wind is like coming in, you know, people started to feel worried like, okay, this is, this is not a safe place anymore. And then all of a sudden we noticed that, the, that it started to get quiet. And in a few minutes, it was totally calm. It was just quiet. And we walked outside the hotel and just the wreckage was unbelievable. It just looks like it went through a blender. These pillars have just been torn out. Being in the eye of a hurricane, it's, it's weird because it, it, it's so calm that you almost forget that you're in the exact center of a violent storm. You literally almost forget that you're only halfway through it and that you have to go back through that craziness again to get out. So we're in the calm eye and all of a sudden it was like someone flipped a switch. And the wind just went from zero to hurricane force in like a minute. And it was roaring, and we're hearing these popping sounds that sounded like gunshots. And we're standing in the lobby, and then all of a sudden, boom. Will Josh and the other guests survive the intense force of Hurricane Odile? November 2016, Gatlinburg, Tennessee a popular tourist destination at the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. A wildfire had been burning on chimney tops for several days, which was over 3,000 feet above Gatlinburg. Despite the fact a cloud of smoke was now choking the town, the authorities initially thought there was nothing to worry about, as the fires would just burn themselves out. Being a distance away from Gatlinburg, they also believed this didn't present any immediate danger to people living in the vicinity. Michael Luciano and his stepbrother Anthony lived in the mountains about four miles above the town. November 28th started as a pretty normal day. You going to work with us, Red? Red, Red. You really didn't know if anything was wrong. When you called the police department or you called or asked any official, you know, in Gatlinburg, everything was told to us, you know, it's okay. It's just the it's just the fire in the park. It's burning. It'll burn itself out. Well, earlier in that day, we had reports of fires up on the chimney tops. And we were responsible for trying to help and assist as needed. We had our crews in the area uh, ready to go. And then as time went on, uh, we started to get more calls and realized that this is something that was going to be extremely serious. Wildfires are actually very rare in the Great Smoky Mountains, as it's normally too wet. However, this autumn was the hottest and driest in Gatlinburg history. This drought, combined with strong winds, which were knocking down power lines, was probably the most likely cause of what was to follow. Electrical fires caused by extreme weather. As we drove through Gatlinburg, Gatlinburg had more smoke um, you know, it was very unhealthy. People were walking around with masks on their face. And we saw that and we were thinking, you know, we, we, we didn't really know what to think. So I said, you know, we're, we're just gonna go home. We opened a beer up and we were drinking a beer and that's when I heard the wind start to pick up and I heard those banging noises and that's when I decided to go outside and investigate with the cell phone and start filming. You can hear trees falling in the background. 
electrical transformers blowing up. Wind's pretty bad. It was just an eerie combination, and you kind of had that weird gut feeling that just something wasn't right. And as I was filming the smoke, I saw a very small ember. I said, I don't see nothing. He says, look on my phone. I see a hot ember coming from the sky. And I look on his phone and I said, holy, holy cow. Look, there's an ember. Wow, this is really bad. It was now 8.30 p.m. and there had already been an electrical fire on the mountain road. Michael and Anthony were getting worried that the fire was spreading. Something was burning close. With the winds that we had at that, at that time, there were 40 to 50 miles per hour. And that's when me and Michael made a decision, we need to get on the four-wheelers and scout out and see what is burning. And about 400 yards from where we're sitting now, there were three cabins on fire, and there was fire enroaching up on another cabin, which would be our neighbor across the street. Yes, we, we need a fire truck at Twin Oaks. And I called 911 and requested a fire truck. They told me a fire truck was on the way, and they hung up on me. <laughs> A wildfire, which is a forest fire or a grassland fire, is a fire that is out of control. And it pushes erratically across the land, eating up anything in its path, whether it be other vegetation, houses, buildings, outhouses. And however much firefighters try and control these blazes, it's really the act of nature which stops them, i.e. a change of wind direction or some rain. At that time, I told myself, it's time to get the hell out of here. You know, this fire with this wind, it is approaching quickly. And this is something that we need to, to get out of here. We, there's no way of playing with this at all. We need to get what we can out of here as fast as we can. You knew the fire was coming. You didn't know if help was coming. We raced into the house and we grabbed what we cherished the most. We were in survival mode. We didn't know how big the fire was. We didn't know what caused it. Um, you know, it was just terrible. Believe it or not, the truck was loaded down with 10 gallons of, of fuel and jerry cans. Basically, we looked at each other and we were grabbing what we could. We thought that that property was gonna would catch because of the winds and, and the approaching fires. Michael and Anthony now had to navigate four miles of treacherous mountain road to try and get to safety. We are now evacuating as Chalet Village is on fire. And we start driving through it. That worrisome fear from being inside the house, you know, are we gonna make it through what we just saw? That really kicked in. The heat driving through the fire was one of the most concerns I had. Shit. Go, 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 go. I should have these tires in RB. Go. I can't see. Just hit that fucking gas. Shh. Oh, shit. God. The smoke was deep and heavy as we were approaching the fires, and it got worse and worse and worse. And I actually had to turn the headlights off and turn the fog lights on. And that's how thick it was. And I still could not see nothing in front of me. I can't see. You can see. Although the brothers didn't know it, the intense fires were raging across a 15 square mile radius as far as downtown Gatlinburg. It had spread to their area in less than 30 minutes. If you would have been walking out there for five or six minutes, even in an area that wasn't affected, one wind shift would have just changed it all for you. You would, you would have perished. We're, we're not gonna make it across that road. Shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. You're good. It really wasn't a wall of fire. It was more of a tornado of fire. Uh, 
The winds had picked up by this time that were, you know, approaching 80, 90 mile an hour um, in the higher elevations where we're at. Oh God, that was a beautiful cabin too. Oh, what was amazing was as we were driving down, it was the cabins. All, every, every single, nearly all of them were on fire. Oh God, please let us get down. I was thinking, I'm just getting off this mountain and I'm surviving. Fuck, hit the gas, hit the gas. Now the smoke is starting to affect your lungs. And this is just driving down. You're in a vehicle. That's like our, our spacecraft. If we lose that spacecraft, we may not make it out of this alive. Fuck. So there were reports at this time that the winds picked up even further, gusts up to 87 miles an hour. So with that, the wind changes direction and the fire spreads. Not only that, with such strong winds, it actually knocks down trees. So there's almost a domino effect and this inferno becomes vast. Oh shit. Go, go, go. We don't need a flat right here. Oh, fucking tree. Fuck, go through it. Go through it. I can't. Fuck. I cannot be stuck. Trapped in the car with fires raging around them, how will the brothers escape this nightmare? In September 2014, Josh Morgerman, a storm chaser, had traveled to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico to record the frightening Hurricane Odile and was barricaded in his hotel. It was now 11.50 p.m. Odile was one of the worst hurricanes ever to hit Mexico and was now raging as a Category 4 storm with wind speeds of over 130 miles per hour. It was just like a bomb went off. A whole glass wall of the lobby just exploded. Glass, furniture, pieces of the building just went flying. And the hotel guests, me and the manager, just scattered like rats. There was something about that moment where, where the building just started to blow apart that it was like, wow, this just got real. feeling of fear that you have from that, you know? You're just like physically trying to protect yourself and that's all that matters. Get under, get under, get under. Just get under, just get under, get under. Are you okay? So uh, one of the hotel workers and I, we were under the reception desk crouched there and it wasn't a safe place because just wreckage was flying around in every direction. The office door opened and um, the uh, another uh, hotel worker just kind of like waved us in and we sort of crawled on the floor into that room and shut the doors. And we thought we'd be safer, but we weren't. And the scary thing was there was nowhere to hide in this office. This building is getting literally torn apart and we're trying to find a safe place. Uh, the whole main lobby just blew away, just everything. And now we're trying to find just somewhere to go before these windows blow out and the ceiling's coming up. So we knew we couldn't stay in that little office because those windows were gonna go and then we'd be just killed by flying glass. So we needed to get out of there, but in order to get out of there, the only way to safety was across that lobby, which had just become a wind tunnel, actually a shooting gallery of flying debris. Oh, okay, let's just try to run for it. Let's just try to run for it. Okay. Do two go first. Yes, I have to go to the door behind that. Okay. 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 Remarkably, Josh and his friends managed to race across the lobby without getting hurt. But the fallout from the hurricane was immeasurable. When you're in a bad hurricane, just the power of it, it's not something a video could capture because it's not just visuals, it's not just sound, it's something you feel it in your chest, the vibration, the intensity of it. It can't be put into words. I was able to find my friend, my cameraman, Steven. Uh, he made it, he made it, he's okay. We're good, we're good, we're good. <laughs> it's uh, a little before 2 a.m. The, uh, the worst of this hurricane has passed, but you can see what it did to this lobby. The 
hurricane finally passed over Cabo at 2 a.m., wreaking havoc for five and a half hours. So Cabo San Lucas has, uh, has been there for a long time. This was the first time in the city's recorded history that it was hit full force by a really, really strong hurricane. And I think people all over the city were just shocked by it. I, you know, talking to people the next day, you know, longtime residents, everyone had tales of terror like ours. Everyone had the same experience of hiding in a closet, in a bathroom, um, you know, under a piece of furniture as the windows were breaking, as the roof blew off, uh, you know, it was just a night of terror across the city. Uh, and for me, it was, it was just terrifying to be in a building as it started to just blow apart. Hurricane Odile took the lives of 11 people, 135 were injured, and over 30,000 locals were made homeless. The cost of damage to property was 1.2 billion US dollars. I've been in many, many hurricanes. Odile was absolutely one of the most ferocious. November 2016, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Michael Luciano and his stepbrother Anthony were trying to escape a raging wildfire when they hit a major obstacle. Oh, fucking tree. Fuck, go through it. Go through it. I can't. Fuck. When we encountered that tree and we saw the massive size of it, we kind of did a double take where I'm like, we, we, we can't stay here. At the tree, that was the point that I actually realized that we possibly may have to evacuate the truck or ditch the truck and go by foot. We gotta get out of here. Hold on. Keep her in here. Oh, man. We tried to leave the truck. Uh, it, it was too hot. I opened the door, embers were blowing in the vehicle. I had to shut the door. Um, there was no getting out at that area. We had crews in an area uh, trying to clear a large tree off of the roadway. And then there was a report of a, another tree that had gone down, a large tree that had gone down a few hundred yards away behind them. So we're in a situation where our TDOT employees and other emergency personnel are trapped by these two trees and there's no way to get out of there. If they're not able to get those trees out of the roadways, you know, th that could have been extremely dire. One shot, one shot and that was it. And I put it in four wheel drive, I backed up and, and just ran the hell out of that tree. We just drove through a tree. Oh shit. No. Does this motherfucker want to die here? This fucking guy. Fucking asshole. What the fuck is wrong with you, go? Get the fuck out of here! We were not out of the woods. Once we escaped the mountain, there were still fires burning. Everything is burning. We just made it off of the mountain. We're on the spur now. And we're just sitting here. In a line of bumper to bumper traffic with flames on both sides of you. And as we're sitting in that line of traffic, there are cars catching on fire. It was apocalyptic. It was apocalyptic. I mean, I it it felt like I was going through war. Caused complete devastation to the mountain resort. Fourteen people lost their lives. 134 were injured and over 150,000 buildings were destroyed. The estimated cost of damage was 500 million US dollars and is regarded as one of the largest natural disasters in Tennessee history. The next day I remember going up there and when I went through these communities, it, it looked like a bomb had gone off. 
the only thing I can equate it to is when you see, uh, you know, pictures from war. So the, imagine just in your own neighborhood where one day everything is just as normal and then that night there's a fire and everything is wiped out around you. The city, of course, they, they shut down the entire city. But we do know back roads. Uh, we were up here within 48 hours. We were actually helping some of the FEMA people that were up here. We actually helped run cadaver dogs around because there were no addresses left. There were no cabin names still posted. They were all burned up. And these first responders, they did a wonderful job, but they couldn't find properties that people lived in to do a proper search to see if they were home or not. It was so bad, the, the fatalities, and, and they were still searching. And, you know, we, we made our way back up here. When we turned into the driveway, I couldn't see the property yet. And I was praying and praying and praying. I said, please, Lord, let the property still, still be here. And right when I came up and I seen the flags and the property still standing, I said, thank God. It was amazing that it survived. It was, it, it, there's just no other, I mean, I, there, words cannot describe it. It was very amazing to see the house still standing on all of your neighbors. Almost every cabin was gone. I could have died. Michael could have died. My brother. Um, Red could have died. You know, it just, it come back to me and I realized, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. The Gatlinburg fires of 2016, well, the land, the topography lends itself to bushfires. So all the elements were there already. The backdrop was there. That's the mountains and an absolute immense fuel load with forests just leading up the mountains and down the other side. All it needed was a dose of drought and that's exactly what happened during the fall of 2016. Many people lost their lives. We were very blessed not to have lost ours. The rains were relentless, they were torrential and unforgiving, raging rivers, raging down the side of the mountain. And Lima really wasn't set up for this. In March 2017, Peru was hit by the worst torrential rainfall in 30 years, resulting in devastating mudslides around Lima. 113 people were killed, and over 150,000 made homeless. This was caused by the unusual warming of its coastal waters, known as El Nino. Let's have a look at Lima. It's one of the driest capitals in the world. Most of the time, the water, the coastal waters, are very, very cold. But it does inhibit cloud growth. But occasionally, those very cold currents retreat as warmer waters come in from the equator and what that means big cloud starts to develop. There's lots of moisture in the air, lots of heat in the air. And any flooding event that happens along this western coast of Peru, it's down to El Nino. Temperatures along that sea surface were five degrees higher than average. Now that is significant. That allows clouds to grow and develop really quickly. And then the rains came. So where you see those thunderstorms develop and drop tremendous amounts of moisture in the El Nino side, that's when they're really going to inundate the coastal mountainous regions of Western South America, and that makes it particularly prone to mudslides. Without warning, dry valleys became angry rivers. And to be honest, the signs were there early on. Chile had suffered some horrendous flooding and people had died. A similar situation the following month in Colombia. And then it was the turn of Peru, and particularly the region around Lima. Conditions were dreadful, but then they got even worse. And that was the problem. The rain 
kept on falling in that small area. The land was dry, the land was arid. It cannot cope with that much water. During a year, on average, Lima only gets half an inch of rain. Now from the 19th of March 2017, for the next week, that area was getting six inches of rain per day. That's 12 seasons worth of rain, just in a space of around eight or nine days. And that was the source of these horrific mudslides. And Lima was in the firing line. So once a mudslide starts, nothing can stop it. Raging torrents of debris, rock, mud, and also water. As they push down the mountainside, they can pick up to speeds of 20 miles an hour. And they are lethal as well, because they will literally destroy anything in their path. And like water, mudslides have their own rips, have their own currents. But once you get stuck under the surface, of one of these mudslides, it's almost impossible to resurface. Can anyone survive once you've been swallowed up by a mudslide? This thing's going in towards more. Yeah, it's on the ground. I've got it on the ground. Moore, a town on the outskirts of Oklahoma City in the Great Plains region of the United States. On the afternoon of May 20th, 2013, Moore was hit by one of the deadliest tornadoes in US history, with a speed of over 200 miles per hour. The Tinker Credit Union was in the direct firing line. Jan Davis, the branch manager of the credit union, wasn't that concerned when she first heard there might be a tornado. I was not apprehensive about the storm. I really, you know, thought it was just another storm, and of course you'd take uh, precautions and uh, do what you need to do when the time comes. That day I just, I came into work security here at the bank um, like, like a normal day. Um, I recall there was a small chance of storms that day, but around here there's usually a small chance of severe weather. So it's just kind of like a normal day for everybody. The morning of May 20th, I actually started off at my other branch. Uh, there was not rain at that point in time. Uh, the rain didn't start until I actually drove over here on 19th Street. It's coming. Oh my God, look at it. Chris, come on. Come on. Chris, it's really, come on. We were about halfway through the day here and I heard about it. We were watching the weather in the break room on the TV. This is a tornado emergency for more than Oh my gosh, complete devastation. And then we begin taking precautions for tornadoes. A tornado is a violently rotating column of air that connects from a cloud to the ground. And you have to have that connection for it to be called a tornado. You also are going to need something that causes that rising column of air to tilt just a little and start to spin. That's called wind shear, different wind speeds and also directions at different heights up above the ground. So it's like you've taken a cake with different layers and then you've tilted it and then spun it just a little bit. As that main updraft goes up into the thunderstorm, you're generally going to see the entire storm start to spin. So now it's no longer what we call a cell, just one isolated thunderstorm. It's become this massive supercell that's spinning. And it's so wide and dark and debris filled that it is, it's really terrifying to see come towards you. Oklahoma itself is the tornado capital of the world. More tornadoes hit here than anywhere else on Earth. Oklahoma is a breeding ground for tornadoes because you have the cold air aloft coming in from the Rockies, the very warm surface air coming in from the Gulf, and it clashes over this state. And it's one of the key ingredients, the stark contrast in temperature, which means that tornadoes can form. The credit union were aware of the dangers of tornadoes and had a plan in place. So the credit union has very specific procedures uh, where if you have inclement weather, you go into a vault or you go into your storage shelter. When I really knew it was going to hit here, I already had everyone inside this vault at that point. The only two that were not in here was myself 
and my police officer, uh, Greg Vandy. Um, we were both outside um, of this vault monitoring the weather and the TV. Um, so it wasn't until a few minutes before I actually came into this vault that I knew we were going to take a direct hit. Okay, let's go to the storm tracker. Tornado emergency now in effect for more. Tornado emergency for more. You folks in more, you need to grab whatever it is you need to grab. Oh my gosh, that is incredible. As it got closer and closer, it was predicted to hit about a mile south of here, and then it changed directions. This is an extremely dangerous um, and life-threatening situation. If you cannot get underground, go to a storm shelter or an interior room of a sturdy building now. I couldn't really see the edge of either side of it. I could see stuff, cars and trees flying through the air, and it obviously looked like it was going to hit here. We've got damage. Okay, I'm watching it. Oh my God, we've got damage. Yeah, I'm all over this. We got power flashes. We got a major, major tornado west of Oak, west of. Yeah, it's heading into Moore. Yeah, it's devastating. It's, it's devastating. And that's when I went and looked out the the back door and saw it was, you know, just pretty much across the street. So I knew it was pretty bad. So I, I ran and got into the money vault. And I've got power lines all over the place. And it looks like I'm gonna have to stop. It's just moving straight east, people. It's moving straight east. I'm gonna try to, I don't know what to do here. I don't wanna get stuck. We're talking here rapid intensification and it's really tricky to get the warning process right. The warning was issued at 2 p.m. that day, but by 2.56, the tornado had to touch down. That is just not enough time for people to be prepared and actually escape the destructive power of such a, an immense beast. This thing is huge. It's taking the May 3rd path. It's going right into more. Will the credit union survive the tornado's deadly impact? The Lima mudslides in March 2017 took 113 lives, literally swallowing people up in its path. And really, when you see those poor people who died, who suffocated, who drowned in those mudslides, I'm absolutely amazed that anyone actually stepped out of it alive. Astonishingly, though, some people did. El río salió de un momento a otro y no nos pudo sacar, no pudimos, no pudimos tener tiempo para sacar todas las cosas. Todas las cosas se quedaron adentro, solamente lo único que podemos sacar es a los bebés y nada más. No sacamos ni ropa, ni pañales, ni leche. Nos hemos quedado todo, se llevó el río de un momento a otro. So people have known for hundreds and thousands of years, this is not a good place to live because it's just too variable, too dangerous. But over the last several decades, there has been more human development in this part of Peru, which meant that you were not only loosening what vegetation was there by building over it, you've brought thousands and thousands of people into this part of the world that is supremely susceptible to mudslides and extreme changes in climate. The catastrophic mudslides in Lima were the worst in Peru's recent history, causing an estimated seven billion US dollars of damage. Twenty-three people crammed in a vault for safety. The Moor Credit Union was in the direct path of one of the most terrifying tornadoes in US history. The first sounds that you hear are just cracking and creaking and busting glass and although it's very loud, the winds are loud, I've heard different people describe it as like a 747 is landing on top of you. It's going towards Moore High School. Three ball right now. Uh, We've got major damage here in Moore, Oklahoma. It's lifted. The tornado is physically on the ground, just destroying power lines. The vault wasn't designed to withstand the force of a tornado, and the credit union had never been hit before. It was a frightening time for all 23 employees and customers stuck in that confined space. The main thing I noticed was the pressure. Um, 
my ears began to pop real, real loud and it was, you know, I was starting to get a, a lot of pressure in, the, in my head. The pressure in your head is so strong when you're inside of the vortex of a tornado that your ears can't pop, so your head just hurts and feels like it's gonna explode. The Moore tornado was defined as an EF5, the most extreme type of storm ever to be witnessed on planet Earth. With that, it was 1.3 miles wide, with wind speeds of around 210 miles an hour. So its destructive force was absolutely immense and it pretty much decimated anything in its path. It's taking a line along 134th and it is, does not look like it's going to let up. So I was trying to remain calm myself. I was obviously nervous, but there were some people in there crying and, and, and praying and screaming. And so I was trying to get them to calm down at the same time, trying to keep myself calm and trying to find to, a way to secure the door from the inside. So if it did hit us, we could keep it from opening. The vault door is designed to lock not with people in it. It's designed to protect the things that are inside of it from the outside. And if I had to describe it to you, as heavy as that vault door was, it started to come open and I was holding it. Um, I knew I couldn't hold it by myself. And I had to hold a jam trying to keep her from being pulled out. It, it was very scary. I had the thoughts going through my head at the time that, you know, this, this, I may get, be getting sucked out of this. When we first heard silence outside, so that was the first indication that maybe we were safe. So we waited for probably two to three minutes, just not sure exactly how long. And then we tried to push the door open. It would open about six inches, but not enough to get a person out. The doors are very thick, so uh, we kept pushing on it. Um, it was probably the scariest moment of the day. The smell of gas was still permeating everywhere and getting stronger by the moment. And um, we were just desperately trying to get the door open, but stuck inside. Everybody was trying to think of different ways to get out, and, and nobody, nobody could, we tried everything we could think of. Five to 10 people pushing on the door, and it just wasn't budging. Eventually, some people that had taken shelter across the street came over to see if there were still people alive on our, in our building, and they actually moved the things that were pinning the door and opened the door enough for us to get out the door. When I exited the vault, I looked around at the destruction all around, and I felt lucky to be alive, but at the same time, I, I felt bad for everybody that had lost as much as they had. Tornado Moore killed 24 people, injured 377, and caused over two billion US dollars of damage to property. There was no ceilings, there were no walls, um, you know, nothing that you had seen when you went in where it was left, it was all gone. It was overwhelming. First thing I did is I, I looked west of here where the hospital was and um, it was totally demolished across the street. All the houses were demolished. And then I looked around at the credit union we were in and saw that the only thing left really was the vault that we were inside. The tornado obliterated the credit union. Everything had to be rebuilt at a cost of over three million US dollars. During a tornado season in the US, there'll be on average around a thousand tornadoes. 
but only 20 will be in excess of an EF3 or greater, that's a violent tornado, and with that, possibly only one EF5. Next time on World's Wildest Weather, heroic rescues from raging floods, bushfires out of control, and tropical storms causing catastrophe in Australia.